My friend recommended a documentary to me recently about Hitler. It was about Hitler's atrocities. But my friend, God love her, she couldn't think of the word atrocities. She tried to cover for a second, she went, ah, uh, while she searched for a synonym, but it didn't come out right. She said, Gary, I saw this very interesting documentary about Hitler's shenanigans. <laughs> shenanigans. <laughs> not even close. And as a Jew, I'm obviously not overly sensitive, but when people trivialize Hitler's monkey business, <laughs> when the Nazis hijinks tomfoolery and ballyhoo is understated, I, I, I feel it does a disservice to the millions who were uh, inconvenienced <laughs> by Hitler's mischief. <laughs> tomato, tomato, shenanigans, genocide. Thank you. Gary, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. You're I'm honored. You're welcome. You're, Thank you. You're welcome. No, I love the special, man. Thank oh, you so thanks much. For, yeah. Thanks for watching. Thank God you liked it. This would be very uncomfortable had you been, had you been. Can I be honest? Lukewarm. With you? you would have no idea. No, I, I, would just... I, ima I imagine. <laughs> I imagine you're a good. Yeah, actor I loved to, it. I loved to, it. It's great. That up. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I love it. You're from Massachusetts, right? You're yes. From Boston area. I'm yeah. from Western Mass. Oh, okay. And uh, I love the way that you talk about Boston. Boston, I think, for people who know it, and maybe for people who don't even know it that well. Is potentially the funniest city I think in the in the country. It's got I, the funniest characters in it. I, r I really think so. There, there's an inordinate amount of self-esteem on people who really have nothing going for them. Um, <laughs> yeah. They just uh, they, there's a there's a great deal of, of confidence, and to grow up around people like that with with uh, wavering confidence was was um, an adventure. It's also a city in many ways of just like pure privilege. Like you know, you go to the south and you go to other places, and you're just sort of like. I get it. Like, I get what's going on here. When you go to Boston, you're like, why aren't you better? Why aren't you just better right now? Like, life was not hard for you. I know. I know. Uh, is that, so you talk about your, your brother in, in the stand-up, really, like yeah. right, at, right off the top. You mind right. you from your family a lot for your stand-up? Um, yeah. I mean, for the, for the first couple hours of my, my material came, came um, mostly from my family and from my upbringing. So I had a lot of, and I, and I lived at home for way too long. I lived at home until I was about 28. So I had a lot of, yeah, really. <laughs> that was like the first the, the two people had the balls to laugh really loudly at that. <laughs> no, I know. I, Everyone else it, is like, oh, oh. It is, yeah, it is, it is way too late. But in Boston, it was, it was very common. I had friends who outdid me. So, um, yeah, most of my. Yeah, we're going to go down to Sully's basement. Yeah, he soundproofed the walls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah dude. Yeah, so they. Um, yeah, so m most of my material came from living around there and the, the people, and I, I had a, uh, a, a short-lived sitcom in the, in the uh, sitcom pilot um, that, uh, that dealt with me living at home and, and growing up around all these... Uh, when was that? That was in 2001, I think. And it, yeah, it was did called... You shoot, did you shoot the pilot, or...? Uh, no, I didn't, I didn't shoot the pilot. I just wrote it with a, with a, um, with a uh, sh what they call a showrunner, a writer, who, um, yeah, it didn't get made. It comes in and, and helps and I you. I got like four. Each, I would get one each year after that, and then and then that whole thing went away. For comedians used to get development deals to make sitcoms on the regular, and and now it's just it's just not done. Really? Yeah. So you so basically you you pitched a pilot that was you living at home. Yeah. You're the star of it, and you're li yeah. you're living at home as an. 28 year old yes and you wrote it and it didn't get made sort of the classic story it just didn't get made right yeah but then you had four more of those yeah yeah the next year i got one the first one was with fox and i got one at cbs then i got one at uh um showtime and then nbc when i was on last comic standing they gave me a development deal and the, but the but the money went down each each time <laughs> it was it was uh it was a pittance by the end but it was it, it allowed me to move out of my parents house initially so that was great did you get the first development deal while you were living with your parents? Yes, yes. What a, they must have been ecstatic. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were thrilled and very impressed. But we also thought that this meant that I would be definitely getting a, a TV show. And, and so it was, it was very disappointing when it didn't come to fruition. Six years later, did you move back in with your parents? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I've, I've gone back there frequently. I, I, I still have a good relationship with my family, but I, I, I never had to move back in full time. Were they supportive while you while you were living with them? Did they know? Did, did they just sort of maintain support unwavering, or was there a part of them that was like, "Get out"? 
Well, yeah, there were there was part that was like you should be a, you should be a writer or something like that, or why not use the accounting degree you have? And I had a series of odd jobs for the for the most part. I was a substitute teacher at my old high school, so that was that was entertaining, and I got to run a lot of the jokes by the kids when I was doing that. Did you so, <laughs> yeah. What were some of their favorite favorite jokes? Can you um, remember? I, re I remember I had a lot of jokes at that time about elementary school, and and so we had we had all gone to the same elementary school, so there were a lot of jokes about how how dangerous the the teachers made the scissors sound in in elementary school, like the like don't run with the scissors for the love of God, but you would leave that that giant paper cutter at the back of the room, which you could be had a cow with that thing, but you would make a big deal out of the scissors, which you couldn't cut jello from those. And this was this is. <laughs> This was stuff that you did at the front of the classroom for the for the kids. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Did it translate yeah. to the club at night? Um, yes, yes. <laughs> Those kids were a pretty good indication of whether it would work on the at the clubs that I would do that night. Yeah, they they were they were pretty sharp. When did you realize that you uh, that you enjoyed performing? Um, I would say when I was when I was about seven years old, I had a I had a magic act that I performed on um, on Easter Sunday, which Jewish people call Sunday, and. <laughs> And uh, I, had a, I had a lot of tricks, but it was my first experience with, with hecklers because my brothers, they were, they, were, they were brutal. They were just like, put, look in his other hand, turn around, roll up your sleeve. What's that coming out of your pocket? And, the, and you're, you're picturing them, I was seven, you're picturing them being like nine or ten years old, which is, which is brutal but forgivable. They were 20 and 21 years old. <laughs> So that was my first experience with audiences. Were like, you? They were your brothers were twenty and twenty one. Were you the last? Uh, the yeah, last yeah, yeah, born? yeah. It was sort of a uh, surprise. A surprise. Yeah, that's, yeah. The, that's the nice yeah, way of putting it. Yeah, they didn't see me coming. Yeah. The surprise that lived at home till he was twenty eight. <laughs> <I know. laughs> <laughs> we can't. We can't get rid of him now. You lived up to the mistake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I made them pay. I made them pay. Yeah. How were, they, how, how were they when you first started doing stand-up? Did they heckle you at all when you were uh, doing stand-up? Um, off stage. That'd be ruthless. Off stage, they would just tell me, you know, you're never going to be able to make a living at this, and it's, you know, only the very best make it in this business. Just give me the. I have this this um, theory that that uh, Christians have an angel and a devil on their shoulder, and and Jews, we have our entire family, living and dead. <laughs> F 5,000 years of fat Jews with soup breath just on our shoulders, questioning our every move, <laughs> undermining our every decision. You're getting a cab? How can you afford a cab? It must be nice. Must be. Look who's getting the guacamole. Mr. Big Shot is getting the guacamole. It must be nice. Must be nice. Oh, they're brutal. And just, they, they suck the joy out of it. I, I ran... I ran five miles the other day, and I was very proud of myself, and then all I could hear is my brother going, oh, and wh how long is a marathon again? Five miles? 26, 26.2. All right, now I don't feel so good about it. Did mom ever run a marathon? I mean, who <laughs> I is she? Come on. <laughs> I know. Uh, when you, uh, you know, your brother's saying, like, the only the best are successful at this, that's not necessarily true. That's one no, of those weird... No, no, I've, pr I've proven that some of the not best no, I mean, you're are successful. I, don't mean, I think best was the wrong word, but I mean mo the most famous or something. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's one of those weird things about the entertainment industry that I think people who are not in it don't understand, is that there are so many people in the entertainment industry yeah. doing things that other famous people do who aren't just as famous as the most famous right. person, you right. know? Yeah. Like, a writer who has a development deal that doesn't get made. It's like yeah. a, actually a, a job where you earn a right. decent living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can make a good living selling ideas. How do you ideas. explain that to your brothers? Uh, they don't. I mean, sometimes they get those those ideas, but then they, when they don't see you on TV, they're they're confused. They're like, well, if you're doing so well, why don't I see you on on TV more frequently? So it's it's just uh, you can you can never win with them. Are you ever like, well, what do you do? <laughs> what, what, do what do you do? <laughs> I know what they do is is much safer and, and more secure, but they don't have nearly as much fun as I do. <laughs> How would you say uh, your your stand up? You have a, a two special. This is your second special. On, this is my on th Netflix. my third special. Your this third is the special. second one that's been on Netflix. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. How would you say your your stand up has changed or developed over the years? Um, the the jokes have gotten a lot longer. So as I've become more comfortable with with silences and the audience not reacting every five or six seconds with a with a laugh or or applause, I've I've made the jokes longer and sort of combined them. So I'm doing more what is called um, long form, where it, where it's just not a setup and a punchline, but it's a lot of it's. Lo I tell a lot of stories now, so I say that's that's one of the ways my my comedy has changed. But I still 
have punchlines every every uh, so often just to keep people with the with the program. I mean, it's it's not um, it's not too spread out between the the setup and the and the punchline. But I think the the jokes are longer and the stories encompass more. Um, more worlds. I feel like that's kind of a, a regular occurrence with comedians as they as they grow a little bit older and come into their own is that they get more comfortable with silences and they do tell long stories. And it's very much like an early days of comedians of being like, I just got to get these yeah, jokes yeah, out yeah, as yeah, fast yeah, as yeah, possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need that that laughter, that oxygen. And if you if you don't get it, you just uh, I need to say something funny before they lose their before they I lose their attention. So there there is a, yeah there is a lot of that. Do you find that uh, at this point in your career? when you're developing this material and you're starting to sort of tell these long form stories very early on that you, uh, for lack of a better word, like you, you may bomb a little bit harder than when you would go out in the early days and tell like 15 jokes as fast as possible. And you sort of have to deal with that a little bit more. Like, you know, this material is going to be good when you figure the yeah, story out. Right. But the early days of workshopping that is not the same as workshopping a setup punchline. Kind yeah, of. Yeah. But I, w I would say that I'm, I'm very gentle with myself and that I don't go out there with a 10 minute story and then just try to work it out. That, that night, I'll go up there with a few sentences that I think are funny, and then maybe if the audience is, is um, amenable to it, I'll add some things in there. So I, I'm mostly doing my, my writing from stage, and then I, I record everything I, I do while I'm on stage, and then I listen to it afterwards, which is, is excruciating. Yeah, I was going to say, it's how the, the hell do you do that? To listen to your own voice, and then to, to have to write down what you just said and, and not think it's just abominable. So I, um, that's how I do it. So I'm more, it's not really writing as much as writing down what I said while I was on stage, because I, I find that the most efficient way to build, a, build long, long stories. Is that the only way that you can listen to yourself, is to like listen and be writing it down at the same time? Like if, I, if I just tell myself, just write down what you say, don't judge it, and don't cry over this, and, and don't feel too bad that it, either it doesn't get a laugh, or don't get too excited if it gets a big laugh. This is just, your, this is just part of the job and, 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 and part of building and a long, a long set. I was just in an editor's bay and I was watching a clip of myself and a sketch that we were making and like I literally my the last words in, in, in the room for me was like Jesus Christ shut this shit off and I like <laughs> stormed out of the room I was like I just could not handle myself at all yeah on yeah camera. it's excruciating by the by the time we finished all the edits on on the special I had seen it so many times that it was just I couldn't there was nothing I could laugh at it was just it was just it was it was nonsense to me so when, when people started saying it was good I was like well I have I have no idea if it's oh yeah you yeah. have you have no idea the end of the day yeah. there was something that made you laugh early on yeah. and then you had to sort of express it in the medium and to, in order to do that you had to work it and just pound it into the ground yeah. and by the time it's out you're just kind of like i have no idea yeah, totally. if this works yeah um one you know in the clip that we saw you talk about uh hitler and someone calling it shenanigans yes. you also talk a little bit about hitler in this and how people sort of overuse uh, certain aspect uh, or overuse ha what we refer to as Hitler-esque or right, kind right, of right. like yeah, Hitler, yeah, yeah. like socialized yeah. medicine. I think you say people yeah. say Obama's like Hitler because of that. Yeah, because of socialized medicine. But but that wasn't our that wasn't our big gripe with with Hitler. We were we were we, <laughs> we were fine with the hospital care. Um, no, yeah, they, there was a there was a picture of Obama with a Hitler mustache right about the time that. Um, that I was doing that that uh, special, so I, I was uh, yeah I was really thrown by that. It, it seems to to be such a, a catch all for anybody who doesn't please you. Well, I was gonna say, are you ready for more of that and from the other side this time? As now that we have uh, Trump in the in the actual election, I mean, yeah, are, I, I, not, I, are you ready? I'm sorry. Are you stoked for that? <laughs> I'm 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 not <laughs> I'm not excited because I don't I don't feel that Trump is a is a Nazi. I think I think he's on this I think he's on the spectrum. But he is not, he is not a, uh, a Nazi. He's, he's way down in, in rounding up and killing of people. He's where is, where, who, if we were looking at the spectrum of Nazi, there's Hitler, right? All right, the way, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the other side of the spectrum, yeah. leads the spectrum. Right. Who's at the, you know, the, just the cusp of the spectrum? Uh, there's probably uh, Henry Ford and, and Charles, Charles <laughs> Lindbergh, I, I understand. Uh, I, 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 I hate, actual supporters. Of I hate Nazism. to. I hate, I hate to say some of the names because they're they're still pretty big names. But I I can't I can't see um, any any um, biography of Walt Disney and not think you know he was a Nazi sympathizer. Yeah, yes true. yes yes. Hey kids, turn in a Jew and get a Mickey Dakota ring. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> and now where, where, where would we say Trump is if we have Walt Disney? Uh, maybe Walt Disney's like, like here. And then we have yeah. Hitler. Right. Trump? No, no, I would put him. I would put him maybe right there with with Disney and and Lindbergh. Okay, possibly. he's right around. Yeah. He's right around Disney. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's yeah. Essentially, if because I, I don't think he's. I don't think he's. Um, I think he's Jew, he's Jew friendly, but he has other groups that he's not as as not as um, uh, in, uh, inclusive of. That is true. Yeah, and he's also extremely inclusive for some reason of white supremacists. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, they they uh, they adore him. They adore him. Yeah, he's their Chuck Norris. No, you're you're <laughs> your stand-up isn't. I wouldn't say isn't uh, particularly or, or overtly political. No. But in this, in what's going on right now, I mean, with Donald Trump, I mean, the clown car Republican primary, <laughs> was it was it almost impossible for you to not be political? Did you feel like you had political things to say and wanted to get out there and do it? Um, here and there. I mean, the the, the thing is now at at this point, the people. Um, are are pretty much done with it, and it's and it's they're they're getting it all over the news and everything like that. And I, I sort of see my my act as as something that it, it takes a little bit longer to build the the joke. So I don't to do something topical. It might take three to six months before I feel like the joke is ready. And by then, you know, nobody really nobody really cares about some of the gaffes that the that the politicians have had. So, in trying to serve an an act that's more um, uh, timeless, it's it's harder to harder to really do political things. But from night to night, I'll mention a, a few things about the, about the races. But, but it never winds up on the special, because I don't want the, right. the special to be um, uh, topical. But when you're doing sort of a uh, stand-up at night, do you find that you want your stand-up to be something that takes people away from the sort of topical debates or something that comments on? Yeah, sometimes, un un unless I can, unless I can uh, bring it back to my, my life and how it's uh, affecting me and, and sort of the, the small ways these things these things affect you. Like I, I never knew the word demagogue, <laughs> and then, um, and then everybody started describing Donald Trump as a demagogue, and I'm like, I gotta look this one up. This is a, this, this keeps coming up. I, I, I hate to be ignorant like that. And now you know demagogue. Now I know demagogue. It's. A, uh, we talked about your family a little bit, and as we said, you, you sort of make fun of one of your brothers at the top of the special. How do they respond to this? I imagine they watch all your specials. How do they take the, the mockery? Uh, they haven't talked to me in about 14 years, so. <laughs> No, they're they're fine with it, and um, I ne I never reveal too many um, inside details that could embarrass them or anything like that. So they're they're uh, they're cool with it. But yeah, there's there's a, a little bit of um, uh, ribbing that they can that they can absorb. I mean, I imagine they give it back. They're boss Bostonian. Oh yeah, you know? yeah. They were they were brutal growing up, so this is a little bit of a payback. Yeah. Uh, let's open up to some questions from the audience. Uh, questions. Hey, Gary. Hi. Thank you for being here. Um, are there any up-and-coming comedians that you enjoy that you would like to give a shout-out to? Oh, yeah. I love, um, I love Joe List, and I love Sam Morrill, and um, I've, I've watched this one, one young guy named Alex Edelman since he was about 14 years old. He started coming to my shows and then doing, doing open mics, so I've been watching him for about 11 or 12 years now, and he's really become a, a very... A very strong comic, but I mean the the other guys that maybe you would would know that I'm just blown away are with are um, uh, John Mulaney and Hannibal Burris. I don't know if you've seen them. They're just they're yeah, see, <laughs> they're remarkable, really impressive. I love when we have stand-ups uh, up here and people ask that question because you always get stand-ups are have so much more of an esoteric knowledge when it comes to other comedians, and they're really the best people to go to for like comics that you may not have heard of. You know? Yeah, like the three that. I, I consider myself someone who loves comedy and absorbs comedy, but the first three people you mentioned, I was like, I don't, I don't. Oh really? Know those oh, that's guys a, yeah, that's that's interesting because those those are the guys I consider younger. They're they're sort of younger than than John Mulaney and, and Hannibal Burris and like Aziz and and that that level. They're sort of the next wave, and I, I think I think you'll Dan Soder is another guy, and I I think you'll see a lot from them over the next few years. Next question. Thank you. Hi Gary. Hi. Um, nice to meet you. I want to have two questions. What inspires you when you're developing your material? And have you ever dealt with someone that you spoke about in your one of your stage your performances that has came at you? And what did you do if you did? Well, has anyone ever come at you? Um, 
I haven't had too much trouble with with any um, anything like that. But what 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 inspires me when I'm coming up? Sometimes it's um, you're getting a little bit of, of vengeance by telling a story and telling it from your point of view and and having all the witty asides and all the remarks and all the the um, comebacks that you weren't able to think of right at that time, and you're able to set them up and tell the story and make yourself come off like much more of an avenging uh, angel there. So so I, w I would say that. But I I um I did have to deal with the girl who said um, shenanigans, because I, she's, she said that that day, and then um, I told the story that night. But a lot of times, I don't, like to, I don't like to write jokes that are only what somebody said, because it's in, well, what did I contribute to it? They, any, anybody can just repeat something they overheard. So I added a lot of those things about monkey business and um, tomfoolery and ballyhoo. So th those are things I added. But she actually said Hitler's, uh, you know, his um, shenanigans. And, and I, I was How did like, she respond to you telling the story? Uh, she, was, she, was very, um, she was very flattered that I included her and, <laughs> and thank, thankful that, that I didn't use her first name. Yeah. Uh, have you ever had trouble with uh, hecklers or anything like that before? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, from my first performance as a magician, uh, my, brothers, my brothers heckled me, and then uh, every once in a while, somebody feels like they're adding to the show by yelling things out. And what's your go-to go to kind of shut it down? Um, I usually like to say, I did not come here to be undermined. <laughs> and <laughs> and that, that, is, that is what oh, you Oh, sorry. I, sorry, yeah. Like, yeah. That's how they respond. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something along those lines usually does the trick. Next question. Hey, Gary, you're a Hi. funny dude. I was oh, going to ask you. you about Heckler, so that's very cool. Um, so I guess growing up, what were a couple of your favorite comedies that uh, you looked... Uh, maybe as a source, as in inspiration to uh, maybe do what you're doing right now? Um, I, th I think the, the most influential uh, television program on me was a show um, starring Chris Elliott called Get a Life that was on for about um, maybe 22 episodes in the summer of, I think, 92 and 91. And um, just the, it was, it was, um, he, was a, he was a loser, a paper boy who lived at home with his parents, and he, um, he had so much confidence, and er it was, he was an arrogant person. And, and I just, I love the story of the powerless um, person who feels entitled. That, that always makes me laugh. It's a lot of the roles Bill Murray has had over the years where somebody really has no power, but they're extremely demanding. That always, that always kills me. So I think that would be the most, the most influential thing. And then, I mean, all the years I watched Saturday Night Live and then, and then watching um, stand-up comedians on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and Seinfeld. I'm, I'm just... Um, uh, some sort of uh, amalgamation of, of a lot of my influences that I, that I saw growing up. And I, I watched a lot of stand-up and listened to a lot of albums growing up. So that's, that's where I get my influence. What was your favorite uh, comedy album growing up, or one of your favorites? Um, I loved Stephen Wright's I Have a Pony, which was just th these um, absurdist and surreal type one-liners that just to this day I can't I, I can't figure out how he how he thought of them or and and also what was so important was that he had the perfect character to deliver them so you know just any anybody couldn't go on there and say these brilliant jokes it had to be somebody with his demeanor and it was it was just a, a perfect um, a perfect vessel for that. Absolutely. Uh, next question. We're going to take our final question from an online viewer. Oh. Uh, so Madison would like to know, what do your heckling brothers do for a living? Oh, oh no. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, the oldest one is a um, sort of a, a tax expert. He's a, he's a CPA. He owns a, an accounting firm. And the, the do you both have accounting degrees? Yeah, we both have accounting degrees. Yeah, I haven't, haven't used mine in, in about 20 years. And he has um, made himself very, very successful with that. And and the other brother uh, sells blinds. Like like blinds for windows. Yeah, curtains for windows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that they have they have different jobs, but um, <laughs> none, none, none of them are giving interviews on AOL. Gary, uh, congratulations on oh, another thank specimen. You. Thank you so, so much for funny. having me. It was a Thanks pleasure for being here. Gary you. Goldman, uh, It's About Time is on Netflix right now.